Hello, my name is Donovan Brown. If you enjoy this video, you can follow me on Twitter, and you can also follow my blog. In this video, we're going to cover data driving a coded UI test, the playback failure exception, which may occur when you're trying to test situations that a user should not be able to do, for example, typing past the maximum length of a text box, and finally the test cleanup attribute, which allows us to run code even after our test case has failed. For this demo, we're using a very simple WPF application with a single text box with the max length set to 5. Also notice that the name has been set. That sets the automation ID for WPF controls, which is important for coded UI tests. Now we're just going to create a simple coded UI test. We're going to select a C-sharp project and go ahead and let it create a test project for us. When you're prompted, simply click on OK, and it'll start the coded UI test builder. I placed a shortcut on my desktop to make the recording a little bit simpler. So let's go ahead and click on Record, and then double-click our shortcut to start the application. Once the application is started, I'm going to go ahead and generate code for those steps or that action to start it called Start App. Now that I've generated that, I'm going to keep recording and I'm going to type in 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 in the text box. I'm also going to generate code for this as well called Type Value. I'm going to be able to use this when I data drive it to override the value that was actually typed in to the text box. So let's generate code for that and let's go ahead and verify that we actually see what we expect to see. So using the crosshairs, I'll highlight that. Notice that the automation ID has been set to the name of the control. And let's add an assertion for 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 to verify that it is actually equal at this point in our test. Let's generate code for that as well called verify value. And we will be able to override those values with data-driven values as well. So let's also record closing the application because I don't want it to be running after my test is complete. And we're going to write code here called close app. All right? Add and generate that. And when it's done, go ahead and close your Code UI test builder. So we're back in Visual Studio. You can see the code is actually generated for us. So let's figure out how we're going to data drive this. We're simply going to go to the test view window, highlight the test, and in the properties window, be able to set what we call the data connection string. Click on the ellipses and let's choose a CSV file. I already have one prepared for this demo, so let me go ahead and load that called data.csv. And as you can see here, we have a type column and a verify column. It's what I want to type in and what I should verify is in the text box. So even when I type all the way up to six, I should only see one, two, three, four, and five. So let's go ahead and add that to our project and let's go change the code so that it actually uses those values. It generated the type value for us. It also generated additional properties that we can override what actually gets typed in there. So underneath the type value params, I can override what it types in there from data that I'm pulling from my data source. To access the data source, I use the test context property. From there, I have a data row property, and then I just use normal notation to get to the column that I'm interested in. I prefer to use the name of the column versus the index so that I can add new additional columns without worrying about it breaking my test. Same is true for my verification as well. So I can verify value can be overwritten to what I read from my data source. So at this point, it's going to type in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and verify it for the first row, and then type in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6 and verify 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 also for the second row because the 6 should not be typed. So let's make sure those are all strings. Let's go back and let's just run our test now. So it's going to rebuild everything. It's going to launch our test. Once we go to test view and simply say run. And now what we should see is our application start. Type in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Type in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And now all of a sudden we get a failure here. What bothers me more about this right now is that our application is still running. Right? I recorded close app, but it didn't close our app. And let's talk about that here for a second before we figure out why it failed. What we can do is actually use some of the attributes that were already put into our code here called additional test attributes. There's a section called the test cleanup which we can actually uncomment out and then move that close app call down into that particular piece of code. This code will run regardless if our test passes or fails. So even if it fails an assertion, it will still close our application. So let's run it again just to verify that. So again, it should fail like it did before, but our application should not be running when we're done. So as you can see, we have a test failure, but our app is no longer running. So let's go see why the test failed. If we go ahead and view the test result details, we can see that the first iteration was fine, the second one failed. By double clicking on that, I can see that it threw a playback failure exception whenever we tried to type in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 because the control will not accept that. So what we're going to have to do is augment our test to make sure that it's actually prepared to handle that scenario. By default, the engine tries to verify that what it tried to type into the text box actually made it. But what we're going to do here is we're going to use a playback setting and actually tell it to skip verifying that what it typed in actually made it into the text box. That way, it will not throw the playback failure exception that we saw before. After I type it, however, I'm going to go back in and set the skip set property verification back to false, just in case any other of my future steps mess up, I'll be alerted to it. So let's go back now and simply run our test again. 
and verify that it actually passes at this point because it should pass this time. So it types in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, attempts to type in all the way to 6, but it fails to type in the 6, and it verifies that, yep, we only get the first five digits. So now let's see what would happen if the developer were to go back in and change the code because we want to make sure that this test is resilient and will protect us against code changes from the developer. So some of the changes he could make, for example, is changing the maximum length from 5 to 6, which is against the requirement, let's say, and is supposed to only accept 5. So at this point, the test should fail because when I attempt to type in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, it will actually take it and it will not be able to verify the column that I want to verify. So let's go ahead and run this now with the code change from the developer and verify that the test it does indeed fail, right? And the reason that it fails is because I expected the second iteration to only have one, two, three, four, and five, and it actually goes all the way up to six instead. Another change the developer could make would be to reduce the amount that it allows. In this case, both iterations should fail. So let's go ahead and rebuild everything and run our test cases one more time and verify that both the first iteration and the second iteration both fail because they do not equal one, two, three, four, and five. So there you have it, a quick look at data driving a coded UI test, how to handle the playback failure exception, and how to use the test cleanup attribute in your test. Feel free to share your comments and suggestions. Good luck!